All right, let's go to 6.23, Special Theory of Relativity. A popular contemporary argument for divine timelessness arises from the concept of time in Albert Einstein's Special Theory of Relativity, hereafter STR. In order to grasp this objection, we need to have some understanding of STR. Although the mathematics of STR are not highly sophisticated, nevertheless, the concepts of time and space defined by the theory are so strange and counterintuitive that most people, I venture to say, find them nearly inconceivable. Undaunted, I shall attempt to explain in as simple a way as possible what Einstein's theory holds with respect to the nature of time and space so that we may then understand how this impacts our conception of divine eternity. Let's begin by setting the theory in its historical context. The physics, which prevailed up until the reception of relativity theory, was Newtonian physics, whose foundations were laid by Isaac Newton in his epical Philosophiae Naturalis Principia Mathematica, 1687. In the scolium to his set of definitions leading off the Principia, Newton explains his concepts of time and space. In order to clarify these concepts, Newton draws a distinction between absolute time and space and relative time and space. And here they are. Absolute time, of itself and from its own nature, flows equably without relation to anything external, and by another name is called duration. Relative time is some sensible and external, whether accurate or unequable, measure of duration by the means of motion, which is commonly used instead of true time such as an hour, a day, a month, a year. Absolute space in its own nature, without relation to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. Relative space is some movable dimension or measure of the absolute spaces, which our senses determine by its position to bodies and which is commonly taken for immovable space. Such is the dimension of a subterraneous, an aerial or celestial space determined by its position in respect of the Earth. Fundamentally, Newton is here distinguishing between time and space themselves and our measures of time and space. Relative time is the time determined or recorded by clocks and calendars of various sorts. Relative space is the length or area or volume determined by instruments like rulers and measuring cups. As Newton says, these relative quantities may be more or less accurate measures of time and space themselves. Time and space themselves are absolute in the sense that they just are the quantities themselves which we are trying to measure with our physical instruments. There is another sense in which Newton held time and space to be absolute, however. They are absolute in the sense that they are unique. <coughs> there is one universal time in which all events come to pass, with determinate duration and in a determinate sequence, and one universal space in which all physical objects exist with determinate shapes and in a determinate arrangement. Thus Newton says that absolute time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external, and absolute space in its own nature without relation to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. Relative 
times and spaces are many and variable, but not time and space themselves. On the basis of his definitions of time and space, Newton went on to define absolute versus relative place and motion. Place is a part of space which a body takes up and is, according to the space, either absolute or relative. Absolute motion is the translation of a body from one absolute place into another, and relative motion the translation from one relative place into another. By translation, Newton means transporting or displacement. Absolute place is the volume of absolute space occupied by an object, and absolute motion is the displacement of a body from one absolute place to another. An object can be at relative rest and yet in absolute motion. Newton gives the example of a piece of a ship, say the mast. If the mast is firmly fixed, then it is at rest relative to the ship. But the mast is in absolute motion if the ship is moving in absolute space as it sails along. Thus two objects can be at rest relative to each other, but both moving in tandem through absolute space and thus moving absolutely. Similarly, two objects, say two asteroids, could be in motion relative to each other and yet one of them at rest in absolute space. Now, in Newtonian physics, there is already a sort of relativity. A body which is in uniform motion, that is, no decelerations or accelerations occur, serves to define an inertial frame, which is just a relative space in which a body at rest remains at rest, and a body in motion remains in motion with the same speed and direction. Newton's ship sailing uniformly along would thus define an inertial frame. Although Newton postulated the existence of an absolute inertial frame, namely the reference frame of absolute space, nevertheless it was impossible for observers in inertial frames which were moving in absolute space to determine experimentally that they were, in fact, moving. If someone's relative space were moving uniformly through absolute space, that person could not tell whether he was at absolute rest or in absolute motion. By the same token, if his relative space were at rest in absolute space, then he could not know that he was at absolute rest rather than in absolute motion. He could know that his inertial frame was in motion relative to some other observer's inertial frame, say another passing ship, but he could not know if either of them were at absolute rest or in absolute motion. Thus, within Newtonian physics, an observer could only measure the relative motion of his inertial system, not its absolute motion. This sort of relativity was long known before Newton. Galileo, for example, understood and illustrated it, so that this sort of relativity is usually called Galilean relativity. Newtonian physics prevailed all the way up through the end of the 19th century. The two great domains of 19th century classical physics were Newton's mechanics the study of the motion of bodies, and Maxwell's electrodynamics, the study of electromagnetic radiation, including light. The quest of physics at the end of the 19th century was to formulate mutually consistent theories of these two domains. The problem was that although Newton's mechanics was characterized, as we have seen, by relativity, 
Maxwell's electrodynamics was not. It was widely held that light and other forms of electromagnetic radiation consisted of waves. And since waves had to be waves of something, uh, for example, sound waves are waves of the air, ocean waves are waves of the water, light waves had to be waves of an invisible, all-permeating substance dubbed the ether. As the 19th century wore on, the ether was divested of more and more of its properties until it finally became virtually characterless, serving only as the medium for the propagation of light. Since the speed of light had been measured, and since light consisted of waves in the ether, the speed of light was absolute. That is to say, unlike moving bodies, light's velocity was determinable relative to an absolute frame of reference, the ether frame. To be sure, in Newtonian mechanics, moving bodies possessed absolute velocities relative to this frame, but within an inertial frame, there was no way to measure what it was. By contrast, electrodynamics, unlike mechanics, was not characterized by relativity. Since waves move through their medium at a constant speed, regardless of how fast the object which caused them is moving, light had a determinable fixed velocity. <clears throat> but now it seemed that one could use electrodynamics to eliminate Galilean relativity. Since light moved at a fixed rate through the ether, one could, by measuring the speed of light from different directions, figure out one's own velocity relative to the ether. For if one were moving through the ether toward the light source, the speed of light should be measured as being faster than if one were at rest. Just as water waves would pass you more rapidly if you were swimming toward the source of the waves than if you were floating motionless in the water. Whereas if one were moving through the ether away from the light source, the speed of light would be measured as being slower than if one were at rest, just as the water waves would pass you less rapidly if you were swimming away from the source of the waves than if you were floating. Thus, it would be possible to determine experimentally within an inertial frame whether one is at rest in the ether or how fast one is moving through it. Imagine, then, the consternation when experiments such as the famous Michelson-Morley experiment in 1887 failed to detect any motion of the Earth through the ether despite the fact that the Earth is orbiting the Sun, the measured speed of light was identical no matter what direction their measuring device was pointed. Some scientists hypothesized that perhaps the Earth dragged the ether along with it, rather like an atmosphere, so that the ether seemed to be at rest around the moving Earth. But this explanation was ruled out by a well-established phenomenon called the aberration of starlight, which was incompatible with ether drag. It needs to be underlined how weird the situation was. Waves travel at a constant speed regardless of the motion of their source, and in this sense are unlike projectiles, which travel at a velocity which is a combination of the speed of their source plus their speed relative to the source. For example, a bullet fired ahead of a speeding police car travels at a combined speed of the car's speed plus the bullet's normal muzzle speed in contrast to sound waves emitted by the car's siren, which travel through the air at the same velocity whether the car is stationary or in motion. 
Consequently, an observer who is moving in the same direction as a sound wave will observe it passing him at a slower speed than if he were at rest. If he goes fast enough, he can catch the wave and actually break the sound barrier. But light waves are different. Light's measured velocity is the same in all directions for all observers. This implies, for example, that if an observer in a rocket going 90% the speed of light sent a light beam ahead of him, both he and the recipient of the beam would measure the speed of the beam to be the same. And this, whether the recipient were standing still or himself moving toward or away from the light source at 90% the speed of light. Desperate for a solution, the Irish physicist George Fitzgerald and the great Dutch physicist H. A. Lorentz proposed the remarkable hypothesis that one's measuring devices shrink or contract in the direction of motion through the ether so that light appears to traverse identical distances in identical times when in fact the distances vary with one's speed. The faster one moves, the more one's devices contract so that the measured speed of light remains constant. Hence, in all inertial frames, the speed of light appears the same. With the help of the British scientist Joseph Larmor, Lorenz also came to hypothesize that one's clocks slow down in, uh, when in motion relative to the ether frame. One thus winds up with Lorentzian relativity. There exist absolute motion, absolute length, and absolute time, but there is no way to discern these experimentally since motion through the ether affects one's measuring instruments. Lorentz developed a series of equations called the Lorentz transformations, which show how to transform one's own measurements of the spatial and temporal coordinates at which an event occurs into measurements which would be made by someone in another inertial frame. These transformation equations remain today the mathematical core of STR, even though Lorentz's physical interpretation of STR was different from the most commonly accepted interpretation today. Let's now take a 10-minute break, and we will return to see how Albert Einstein turned the world on its head by proposing a different interpretation of relativity. In 1905, Albert Einstein, then an obscure clerk in a patent office in Bern, Switzerland, published his own version of relativity. At this time in his young career, Einstein was still a disciple of the great German physicist Ernst Mach. Mach was an ardent empiricist who detested anything that smacked of metaphysics and who thus sought to reduce statements about entities such as time and space to statements about sense perceptions and the connections between them. The young Einstein took what he called his epistemological credo from Mach, holding that knowledge is made up of the totality of sense experiences and the totality of concepts and propositions, which are related in the following way. <clears throat> the concepts and propositions get meaning, namely content, only through their connection with sense experience. Any proposition not so connected was literally without content, meaningless. Given such a verificationist criterion of meaning, Lorentz's absolute time, space, and motion were metaphysical notions and therefore meaningless. Einstein's 1905 article in the Annalen der Physik has been called the most profoundly revolutionary single paper 
in the history of physics. He opens his paper by jettisoning the ether as superfluous, since he says it will not be necessary for the purposes of his paper. Now, in order to talk about motion in a physically meaningful way, Einstein claims, we must be clear what we mean by time. Since all judgments about time concern simultaneous events, what we need is a way to determine empirically the simultaneity of distant events. Einstein then proceeds to offer a method of determining, or rather defining, simultaneity for two spatially separated but relatively stationary clocks, that is, two distant clocks sharing the same inertial frame. This procedure will serve, in turn, as the basis for a definition of the time of an event. He asks us to assume that the time required for light to travel from point A to point B is the same as the time required for light to travel from B to A. Theoretically, light could travel more slowly from A to B and more quickly from B to A, uh, even though the round-trip velocity was always constant. But Einstein says that we must assume that the one-way velocity of light is constant. Having made this assumption, he proposes to synchronize clocks at A and B by means of light signals from one to the other. Suppose A sends a signal to B, which is in turn reflected back from B to A. If A knows what time it was when he sent the signal to B, and what time it was when he received the signal back from B, then he knows that the reading of B's clock when the signal from A arrived was exactly halfway between the time A sent the signal and the time A got the return signal. In this way, A and B can arrange to synchronize their clocks. Events are declared to be simultaneous if they occur at the same clock time on synchronized clocks. Using clocks thus synchronized, Einstein defines the time of an event as the reading simultaneous with the event of a clock at rest and located at the position of the event this clock being synchronous with a specified clock at rest. Now, so far, the use of light signals plays no special role. One could have used bullets to synchronize distant clocks, so long as the bullets travel with uniform velocity. Now, all this may seem quite unobjectionable and even humdrum, but in fact, the very foundations of the world have just moved. It is with good reason that Banesh Hoffman advises, watch closely. It will be worth the effort. But be forewarned, as we follow the gist of Einstein's argument, we shall find ourselves nodding in agreement, and later almost nodding in sleep, so obvious and unimportant will it seem. There will come a stage at which we shall barely be able to stifle a yawn. Beware. We shall by then have committed ourselves, and it will be too late to avoid the jolt, for the beauty of Einstein's argument lies in its seeming innocence. Its seeming innocence. For under the euphemism of disregarding the ether as unnecessary, Einstein thereby abandoned not merely the ether, but more fundamentally the ether reference frame, or absolute space. Without absolute space, there can be no absolute motion or absolute rest. Bodies are moving or at rest only relative to each other, and it would be meaningless to ask whether an isolated body was stationary or uniformly moving per se. So, <clears throat> Now suppose that we have inertial frames which are moving with respect to one another. For example, a rocket ship passing near the Earth 
on its way to a distant planet. Suppose that when the rocket ship is close to the Earth, its clock agrees with the clock of an Earth observer. At that moment, the observer on Earth sends a light signal to the planet, and an observer on board the rocket does the same. Here, the fact that light is the signal plays a crucial role. For since light travels at the same speed relative to all inertial frames, the ship's signal does not travel any faster than the Earth's signal. But the two signals travel in tandem and reflect back from the planet together. But in the meantime, the rocket ship has moved closer to the planet and so return, receives the return signal first. Because light's speed is the same for all inertial frames, the observer in the rocket ship cannot detect his own velocity by receiving the signal. The same is true for the Earth observer when his signal is then received. But when the rocket and the Earth observers divide the light signal's travel times in half, they will get different times for when the signals reached the planet. It might be protested that the rocket ship's measurements are distorted because it was moving toward the planet. But relativity demands that the rocket ship could, with equal justice, be regarded as at rest, with the planet approaching it and the Earth receding away. Remember, there is no absolute space, and so no absolute rest on Einstein's theory. Hence, given Einstein's definition of simultaneity, different events are calculated to be simultaneous in different inertial frames, and none of these is the preferred frame giving the correct time. All of the various measurements in various frames are correct for each respective frame. We now see why Einstein entitled his paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Given the constancy of the speed of light in all inertial frames, bodies in motion will be related to each other electrodynamically in such a way that the use of electromagnetic signals to establish synchrony relations between them will play havoc with what we normally mean by simultaneity. What happens is that simultaneity becomes relative. Einstein writes, thus we see that we can attribute no absolute meaning to the concept of simultaneity. But the two events, which examined from a coordinate system, are simultaneous, can no longer be interpreted as simultaneous events when examined from a system which is in motion relatively to that system. <clears throat> what this means is that events which are simultaneous as calculated from one inertial frame will not be simultaneous as calculated from another. An event which lies in A's future may already be past or present for B. In fact, Events which are not causally connected can even be measured to occur in different temporal order in different inertial frames. Einsteinian time and space have many other weird properties, such as time dilation, according to which moving clocks and all physical processes run slower and slower as their velocity increases, and length contraction according to which moving bodies contract in the direction of motion. Now, these were also characteristic of Lorentz's theory, it will be remembered. But the key difference with Einstein's theory is that since he denies an ether frame, these phenomena are reciprocal. For two relatively moving identical rockets, A and B, B is shorter than A, and his clock runs slower than A's relative to A's inertial frame. But A is shorter than B, and his clock runs slower than B's relative to B's inertial frame. Since no inertial frame is preferred, there is no true length or true time per se, only lengths and times relative to different frames. 
Now, as I said, the Einsteinian world is extraordinarily difficult to conceive. We intuitively think that there is a unique and universal time in which all events, however distant from one another, occur, and a unique and universal space in which all physical objects exist. But Einstein's theory tells us to substitute for absolute space an infinite number of different spaces, each associated with a different inertial frame, and for absolute time, an infinite number of different times, each associated with a different inertial frame. Reality is thus radically fragmented on Einstein's view. Only observers sharing the same inertial frame, that is at relative rest, have the same time and space. Observers in other inertial frames, that is in relative motion, live in a different time and space. It is, I think, no exaggeration to say that on Einstein's theory, relatively moving observers literally inhabit different worlds, which may intersect only at a point. So what impact does STR have on the nature of divine eternity? Well, just this. If God is in time, then the obvious question raised by STR is, whose time is he in? For according to Einstein, there is no unique universal time, and so no unique worldwide now, since none of the infinitely many inertial frames is privileged or preferred no hypothetical observer can justifiably claim that his now is the real or true now. Every inertial frame has its own time and its own present moment. And there is no overarching absolute time in which all these diverse times are integrated into one. So the question is, which is God's now? The defender of divine timelessness maintains that there is no acceptable answer to this question. We cannot plausibly pick out some inertial frame and identify its time as God's time because God is not a physical object in uniform motion, and so the choice of any such frame would be wholly arbitrary. Moreover, it is difficult to see how God, confined to the time of one inertial frame, could be causally sustaining events which are real relative to other inertial frames, but are future or past relative to God's frame. Similarly, God's knowledge of what is happening now would be restricted to the temporal perspective of a single frame, leaving him ignorant of what is actually going on in other frames. In any case, if God were to be associated with a particular inertial frame, then surely, as God's time, the time of that frame would be privileged. It would be the equivalent of the classical ether frame. But then we're back to Lorentzian relativity, not Einsteinian relativity. So long as we maintain with Einstein that no frame is privileged, then we cannot identify the time of any inertial frame as God's time. Neither can we say that God exists in the now associated with the time of every inertial frame, for this would obliterate the unity of God's consciousness. In the words of one philosopher of science, God would have an infinitely split personality, each sub-personality evolving in monad-like isolation from the others, a hypothesis in which he detects the faint scent of polytheism. In order to preserve God's consciousness as the consciousness of one being, we must not allow it to be broken and scattered among the inertial frames of the universe. But if God's time cannot be identified with the time of a single frame or of a plurality of frames, then God must not be in time at all. That is to say, he exists timelessly. We can summarize this reasoning as follows. One, STR is correct in its description of time. Two, if STR is correct in its description of time, 
then if God is temporal, he exists in either the time associated with a single inertial frame or the times associated with a plurality of inertial frames. Three, therefore, if God is temporal, he exists in either the time associated with a single inertial frame or the times associated with a plurality of inertial frames. Four, God does not exist in either the time associated with a single inertial frame or the times associated with a plurality of inertial frames. Five, therefore, God is not temporal. Now, before we give some response to this, let me ask if there's any comprehension type question about this argument for divine timelessness based on special relativity. Grace. So I understand the general direction you're going with making the case for this, but to what are the implications for then how God experience, like does God experience in his consciousness a sense of cause and effect, even though he's able to inhabit all of the different dimensions of time? Does that make sense? Yes, or it, it does make sense, and it, it's a hard question. Um, as someone said earlier, on this view, um, God would need to be tenselessly and changelessly related to creation. So if he is causing things to happen in the world, these must be changeless, tenseless relations between a timeless God and things happening in the universe. Um, and the question is, how in the world is that possible? Uh, that's a real challenge for the defender of divine timelessness. And would the mainstream idea be that in heaven we would be part of that way of being? Or well, that I think not on a Christian view, Grace, because on the Christian view, our hope for immortal life is a resurrection body, which is not frozen into immobility like an ice statue, but is dynamic and active and therefore temporal. So e even if God is timeless, this is not going to be a state that the blessed in heaven will share. 